Let's talk about the characteristic magnetization of a DC motor, a wire that is carrying a current and is sitting inside a magnetic flux experiences a force. That force is called the Lorentz force. If the flux and the wire are perpendicular to one another, which is the case in machines, the force is given by this very simple formula. The force in Newtons that the wire experiences depends on the flux density B in Weber's per meter squared, that is in Teslas, the current in the wire in amps, and the length of the conductor inside the, the wire. Not the total length of the wire, only the section of the wire that is inside the magnetic flux L in meters. That is the Lorentz force, the Bell force I call that in my course. We call that the motor action. Force on the wire is Bell. Flux? What flux? Well, as a precondition to the operation of the DC machine, either a motor or a generator, we need to have a magnetic flux in the air gap, which is where that wire with its current will be, where the action is. How do we do that? We excite the machine. Please watch the movie on excitation of a DC machine. The excitation will happen this way. We have one or two coils in the magnetic circuit of the machine, NF, and NS, number of turns, and in them we set some currents IF and IS, and those currents will be responsible for creating the magnetic flux that will be taken by this piece of iron, this magnetic circuit over to this air gap, which is where the rod, the conductor of the wire, will have its current and will experience the motor force. Of course, this is not a real machine. This is only an intellectual exercise called a linear DC machine. What creates that flux, again, are those two currents, or rather, the magnetomotive force applied by those currents in coils with the number of turns NF and NS. In reality, in the machine, we call those coils the field coil, the current IF, the field coil, current NF, etc., etc., and this is a series coil. In the real machine, the wire, the conductor with its current, is sitting on a moving drum like so. One on the top, one on the bottom, and connected in ways we will see in a different video, because today it is about the flux. And the flux is created by this coil, the F coil, and its current IF, by this other coil, the S coil, and its current IS. If they are connected properly, their magnetomotive force will be helping one another and creating a flux in the air gap where that wire will be sitting and waiting to experience its motor action, its Lorentz force, its bill of force. That magnetomotive force applied by those two currents in those two coils are NFIF for this coil plus NSIS for the other coil. If you are not familiar with magnetic circuits, please do watch the movie in this series about magnetic circuits. But how much flux are we going to get in the air gap for a given current IF or a given current IS? The relationship, unfortunately, is not linear. It is given by curve. It is given by the magnetization characteristic of the motor or the generator. That is given by the manufacturer. That curve looks in general something like this. In an ideal world, that curve would give us what is the flux in the air gap for a given value of the magnetomotive force applied by the S coil and the F coil, that is, by this magnetomotive force. We would compute the MMF this way, and we would enter the curve down here with that MMF value and find what is the flux in the air gap. But no. The manufacturer decided, for reasons of his or her own, to divide that value by NF and present the horizontal axis so distorted by NF by the value IF star IF asterisk. That is a value you will find here in the horizontal axis. It's called the equivalent field coil current that would create the same total magnetomotive force in the F coil. That is the value you're going to get here. Enter the curve, and you would find the flux. No, because again, the manufacturer figured the user does not need the flux. The user 
will be targeting the curve to use this expression to find the induced voltage in the armature and this uh, induced torque in the axle of the machine on the shaft. If you don't remember those formulas, please watch the other movie called the induced voltage and induced torque in a DC machine. But in both formulas, you see K5 omega, K5 current in the armature. Oh, well, the user, well, the manufacturer decided to multiply the vertical axis by K, and that would have been sufficient to us. But no, the manufacturer decided to do something else. The manufacturer decided to multiply K5 by omega, a certain omega that he or she uses to test the machine omega test. That isn't reality. The induced voltage in the armature and that velocity omega test, and that is the curve. The curve reports the voltage induced in the armature for a given value of IF tar if the machine had been rotating at omega test radians per second. In reality, the omega is given as an N, as an RPM value. We better show how this works in a tutorial. A DC motor has a field coil with 4,000 turns per pole, has a series coil, the S coil, with 25 turns per pole. The field current IF is 0.7 amps. The series coil current IS is 67 amperes. Independently, we have found out that the armature induced voltage EA is 200 volts. We know that for a fact. What is the actual velocity of the motor? We are also given this curve, the magnetization characteristic of the motor EA at the test velocity of 1200 RPM for the values IF star. Sometimes given us a table like this one. What is the first thing we're going to do? We will compute IF star so we can enter the horizontal axis of the curve. IF star is given by those four parameters. 4,000 turns times 0.7 amps plus 25 turns times 67 amps divided by NF, 4,000 turns. That is 1.12 amps. That is IF star. We go with that value 1.12 into the curve, either in the graphical one or we interpolate in the table. And what we're going to get is that the voltage would be 288. So that means if the motor had been rotating at 1200 RPM, that is what the curve says. Its induced voltage EA would have been 288 given the values of IF and IS. But alas, the actual EA is not 288, it's 200, what it gives. The actual velocity is not 1200 RPM then. How is that? Well, the value given in the curve was computed as K5 omega test at 1200 RPM, converted into radians per second, that is 288 volts. But the actual induced voltage, 200 volts, is K5 at the actual velocity, whatever that is. K5 is the same in both cases because K5 depends only on IF and IS, and that is what that is, right? So the relationship between EA of the curve 288 and the actual EA 200 is the same relationship that exists between 1200 RPM and the actual velocity of the machine. We deduce that N is 833 revolutions per minute. That is the velocity of this machine. Well, that is part one of the exercise. Let's include something else. If the motor had been rotating at 1200 RPM, its EA induced voltage would have been 288 volts. We have seen that. Let's say that we measure independently that the armature current, IA, is 72 amps. EA is K5 omega. We can solve out for K5 as the induced voltage divided by omega. In our case, 288 volts divided by omega. Omega in radians per second at the curve. The curve is at 1200 RPM. Convert 1200 RPM into radians per second. One revolution, two pi radians. Divided by 60 seconds per minute, we have radians per second here and K5. And then we can use this formula. 
the induced torque in that machine K5IA is 229 times 72 ohms, 165 newton meters. And that is all. My dear invisible friends, thank you very much for keeping company with me tonight. I hope to meet with you again in our next movie. That is all.